Good morning. Uh, really nice to be here. Nice to see so many familiar faces, um, friends. Uh, my title is Nexus Indissolubilis, uh, loosely Augustinian meditation on the spousal embrace. Amen, amen, I say unto you, unless the grain of wheat should fall to the ground and die, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Christ's words express the law, not only of Christian life, but of all creaturely life, indeed, of all creaturely being. To those who have eyes to see, this law reveals itself in the very physical pattern of the spousal embrace. This is why, as Hans Urs von Balthasar observes in a luminous passage from Homo Creatus Est, sexual love is closely related to death. He who begets says yes to his own death, not just physiologically, but also in some sense spiritually. The man gives himself away to the woman, but the woman also gives herself away to the man. Both pronounce their yes to their own impermanence. The child not only must live, it must outlive them. The father withdraws from the stage so that his son can take the, the place in the limelight that is due him as his father's heir. And yet, where does the wave of life rise up more loftily than in the generative act? Where is life more conscious of its potency than in the pleasure of giving itself away? Mustn't we say that life is never more alive than when it gives itself up and dies over into the other? That it reaches its apex precisely when it realizes what it means to be a vessel whose contents are greater than the vessel itself? That's Balthazar, um, but, uh, in his treatise on the divine names, uh, Dionysius describes erotic love in strikingly similar terms. Eros, he says there, is a gladly suffered ecstasy that robs the lover, oh blessed privation, of any power to belong to himself alone or to exist apart from communion with the beloved. Dionysius is speaking primarily about God's love, but as he himself emphasizes, all creatures, including ourselves, participate together in different ways in this divine eros. The point Balthazar adds in the passage I just cited is that the spousal embrace represents a privileged form of this universal participation. The embrace, Balthazar is saying, represents cosmo cosmic eros, awake to itself as an ecstatic self-transcendence that, for a fleeting moment at least, receives, shares in, and reflects back the divine eros in which actuality and generosity, being and love, are always already fruitfully one. Mustn't we say that life is never more alive than when it gives itself up and dies over into the other? In formulating this question, Balthazar highlights the remarkable intertwining of life and death within sexual eros, as I just described it. The death he means is at once our physical death, which sex anticipates, and the good death to self, which sex implicitly realizes in that very anticipation. Balthazar sees this good death, moreover, not as foreign to life, but as intrinsic to its overflowing completion. The spouses, he is saying, are never more complete in themselves, or never more completely one, than when they have and enjoy themselves in what he calls the act of giving themselves away. Here, Balthazar joins hands across the centuries with Aristotle, who teaches in book two of De Anima that a living thing is never more in possession of its life than when it shares it by bringing forth another like itself. Even for Aristotle, the begotten is not simply a prolongation of the begetter, but a second self having the begetter's nature in its own proper right. Even for Aristotle, then, the begetter becomes another for the begotten, thus letting the begotten be, even to the point of allowing the begotten to take it, the begetter's place, in the order of things. What Balthazar emphasizes is simply that this letting go, this dying to self, coincides with the possession of, and experience of life in abundance. In Balthazar's hands, the Aristotelian adage, which scholasticized sounds like this, omne agens agit sibi simile in quantum est actu, every thing that's in act um, uh, brings forth something like itself insofar as it is in act, 
that this adage fully reveals its transparency to the cosmic law formulated in Christ's parable about the grain of wheat. Of course, the spousal embrace, which is after all what we're talking about, fulfills the law of fruitfulness, as it were, bidirectionally. In the embrace, in the complexus, the begetter is actually two co-begetters whose ecstatic ecstasy or ecstatic ecstasy tends towards each other and towards the child in one and the same act. Let me repeat, these two movements are not separate events, but how shall I put it, two irreducibly distinct ways of being the same event. We're dealing with a single irreducible indivisible reality that is entirely the mutual ecstasy of man and woman towards each other and entirely their conjoint ecstasy towards the child. Or to put it in the language of Humane Vitae 12, the spousal embrace is constituted by an indissoluble nexus between the signification of unity and the signification of procreation. To which we only need add that the nexus does its constituting work in such a way that one and the same embrace is wholly unitive in being procreative and wholly procreative in being unitive. The formula here is procreatio in unitate et peream, et unitas in procreatione et peream. Now, no one who thinks about it can reasonably deny that the culmination of genital union, union let's call it that, admittedly an ugly term, um, physically coincides with the transmission of generative seed. What Paul VI reminds us in Humanae Vitae 12 is that this physical coincidence is saturated with significance. Even more, he reminds us that it is already a significatio, a, signo a symbolic signifying of the twofold event of ecstatic ecstasy and static ecstasy described by Balthazar in the passage which I opened with. Even as a biological act, interweaving union and procreation into a seamless unity, the embrace is a beautifully ordered ensemble of what John Paul II called anticipatory signs, signifying and pledging, and here I add the twofold spousal gift of self after the fashion of the creator's wise purpose. Note that the beginning of the self-gift Pope John Paul speaks of doesn't lie simply or even chiefly in the conscious choice of the partners. It's, it's good if it gets there, right, but it doesn't start there. Its primary loc locus is Eros itself. Anyone who has ever been in love or even just been in a, in a new friendship um, will understand what I mean. Right? It's not just that you, the lover, are drawn out of yourself by the beauty of your beloved. Even more deeply, you and your beloved simultaneously discover with a kind of surprise-filled recognition that you already belong together somehow, even before you knew it. It's as if in one and the same act, Eros both descended from above you and welled up from inside of you as a kind of with, as a sinusia that is already on its way to overflowing itself through your joint self-outpouring. Here again, we catch sight of the two-in-one ecstatic ecstasy or ecstatic ecstasy um, of created being that, according to Balthazar, finds particularly dense expression in sexual love. It's because sexual love exists to be this parable of cosmic eros, Paul, Paul, Paul VI and John Paul II are telling us, that it comes, as it were, already incarnate in the spousal embrace which is constituted by the inseparable physical nexus between union and procreation. Now, I'm just going to get dark for a few minutes and talk about contraception. Let me pause here to point out that if John Paul II is right, any assault on the physical nexus between union and procreation, right, even if it's just on the chemical level and you can't see it, is also an assault on its anticipatory signification of nuptiality. This is why contraception, to take just one example, doesn't merely subvert the end of the reproductive faculty, which it does, and that's already bad, but in so doing, it automatically subverts the spousal vocation of sex along with it. Contraceptive sex is inimical to the expression of the marital bond in the sexual sphere. <laughs> 
and I would say, for that very reason, inimical to sex itself, whose nature is fulfilled only within the contours of the spousal embrace, the complexus sponsalis. There are few things more unerotic because uh, a nuptial than contraception. It's actually gross. An implication of the foregoing is that to frustrate the procreative dimension of sex is also to frustrate its unitive dimension as well. What looks like union in such a case is only its adulterated simulacrum. It's not just that sexual union is physically inseparable from procreation. That's reason enough why if you suppress the one, you lose the other. It's also that honoring this fact, or at least not dishonoring it, I mean, the bar is pretty low, right, that, that the church sets is pretty low, just not dishonoring it, is a sine qua non of enjoying the embrace for what it is. Now, only such enjoyment can be pleasure in the common sexual good rather than pleasure in distinct or even diverse private goods. But it's precisely such private goods that the contracepting couple are by, by definition now pursuing. To the frustration even of their personal appropriation and appreciation of the unitive side of the act. Contraception has turned what should have been an instance of their nuptial communio into, to borrow a word that's current around here, its diabolical opposite, an attempt to enflesh the illogic of divorce. Let me stress that nothing I've said so far entails an account of sexual union as a merely instrumental good, much less as a necessary evil to be tolerated for the sake of procreation, you know, do it for the empire. Um, <laughs> Now, it's true, of course, that the possibility of procreation often appears to us as an external constraint imposed upon the free play of sexual arrows. Sex, after all, is always naturally attractive, but it's not, it doesn't always naturally result in a child. Nevertheless, and here is, a, I think, an Augustinian thought, the very unpredictability of conception is a salutary reminder not only that there is an essential connection between sex and reproduction, but also that this connection is God's work, which we therefore are to administer as faithful stewards and not to dominate as unaccountable tyrants, which is the either or that Paul VI is placing us before in Humani Vitae, actually, I mean, quite explicitly. That said, I want to stress that procreation isn't merely an external justification or legitimation of sexual love, but also and primarily an internal condition of the goodness and intelligibility of sexual love itself, both qua sexual and qua love. If sex is a fruition of being self-giving fullness, if it's an experience of the convertibility, as it were, of fruition, giving, and being in which love's very freedom consists, then the plenitude of its joy includes liberating obedience to the law of generation, which is nothing other than the logic of self-communicating actuality taken to its own ultimate consequence. To be sure, and just one last point about the contraception issue, the conception of a child occurs, if at all, only after a certain lapse of time, right? Everybody knows that. Nevertheless, this necessary waiting period turns the sexual act into a gesture of hope which anticipates the fruit, that there too it's a kind of anticipatory sign, um, the fruit being here, the I, that, that I mean being the conception of the child, um, but without grasping at it. Indeed, by not grasping at it, you, you have to let it go. Right? That's the very nature of the act. By not grasping at it, by being ready to receive it, if and when it should be granted. In the interim, this readiness, this kind of resting in the given awayness of the, of the sexual powers into God's hands is already fruitfulness enough. But it can only be fruitfulness enough if the given awayness has actually happened. Okay, what I said was partly dark. Contraception is kind of dark. But I've been using the example of contraception mainly as a foil for the positive human significance of the physical nexus between union and procreation. We can describe the significance by saying that the nexus shapes sex as a reciprocal bodily exchange of two, union. That's also their joint communication of life to a third, procreation. The singularity of the resulting embrace speaks for itself. 
What other use of the sexual organs could conceivably interweave all of these elements? The physical union of the sexes, their communion and generation and their face-to-face -face encounter into a single seamless gestalt. What other physical gesture or act could plausibly serve as the analogatum princeps, the proper and primary referent of the term sex? Aren't we dealing with a kind of Goethe and primordial phenomenon, one constituted here by an original irreducible correspondence between the idea of eros on the one hand and the one physical act that seems fully to deserve the name sex on the other? But why should eros, insofar as it's sexual, come already incarnate in the spousal embrace with its inseparable nexus of union and procreation? The rest of my paper, just a few more pages, um, is devoted to a theological and metaphysical meditation on this question. I call my meditation loosely Augustinian in that, um, at least genetically, I mean, a lot of waters float under the bridge, but um, it's inspired by, without being anything like a direct exegesis or defense of, Augustine's treatise on the good of marriage, De Bono Coniugale, on the good of marriage. It may seem counterintuitive to turn to the Bishop of Hippo for inspiration on this topic, given modern theology's widespread repudiation of his teaching that, quote, the act of lying together for the sake of begetting is inculpable and it alone is nuptial. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, this teaching is like a hard shell protecting a sweet and delicate fruit. Augustine's platonic and biblical insight into the spousal nature of sexual eros. For all of its ambiguities and loose ends, real or imagined, De Bono Coniugale offers precious resources for reading sex as a nuptial symbol of being as love. So what follows is just kind of a series of points. Um, there are 11, actually, and each successive one builds on the one before it, um, more or less. Um, and it's, it's a meditation. <laughs> so I begin the meditation ex abrupto with the absolute beginning. This is point one namely God the Father, whom I propose to describe here, if he can be described, as the original verification of the truth formulated in that scholastic adage that I cited just now, omne agens agit sibi simile in quantum est actu. It's insofar, insofar as it's an act, every actual thing tends to communicate its actuality to another, which therefore reveals what lay in the productive power of its cause. Even in the case of human begetting or artistic production, this revelation elicits delight from the, from the cause. Scripture seems to hint that the same thing is true in Divinis. Here the Father eternally generates his consubstantial image. Here he just as eternally delights both in the image's natural identity with and personal otherness from himself. This delight, always already mutual in the embrace of begetter and begotten, eternally overflows in and as the Holy Spirit, who puts a personal face on the reciprocal joy of father and son and on its ecstatic, condelective self-transcendence. It's as if the divine Eros Dionysius discerns in the ensemble of God's self-communicative processions, found its original in the self-expansion that's at once personal and natural of the Father's fecundity in the Godhead. Two, the Father's self-communicating actuality includes the archetype of all productive power. Clearly, there is never a time when this power of his is merely potential. The Father has immemorially exercised it to the full. But he has done so precisely by giving, better, by having give, excuse me, giving, better by having given everything, including his productive power itself. So much so that the Son and the Spirit are immemorially internal to and co-constitutive of the Father's productivity. The one by letting himself be begotten, that's passive generation. The other by letting himself be co-spirated by begetter and begotten, that's passive spiration. The Father efficaciously owns his productive power with all the fontal initiative this implies by receiving it back as the fruit of its own immemorial given awayness. The fruit here being nothing other than the divinely self-receiving persons of his only begotten and their common Holy Spirit. Three, 
The Father is not content, however, to communicate his fecundity within the deity alone. He graciously wishes to diffuse it ad extra as well. Yet he doesn't share his fruitfulness with creatures only insofar as it is proper to himself. Above and beyond that, he shares it with them insofar as it is unfolded in the communion of begetter and begotten in the spirit. In his romances, John of the Cross recounts in poetic form the father's desire to give his son a, t a created bride, to commune with him, the son, as he himself communes with his father in the spirit who is love. Another mystical theologian, Meister Eckhart, explains that the bride's spousal communion with the son is the very principle enabling her to beget him, the son, back into the paternal heart. It's precisely by being the son's asymmetrically diverse, spousally receptive partner that the bride does in her own mode what the son does in his. Share in the father's fecundity and reflect it back to him in unitate spiritus sancti. All this sounds quite mariological because it is. Our lady is the created bride par excellence because as the creaturely cause of the incarnation, she is also the canon God looked to in conceiving all of her fellow creatures. Four, desiring to give his son a bride with whom to share his fecundity, the father brings both creaturely eros and the sexual difference into being out of a single impulse of love. The two realities therefore re reflect each other by virtue of their common origin. Inasmuch as it is the bride's yearning for the father's fecundity, creaturely eros reflects the sexual difference, right? Bride, female, sexual difference. Insofar as the sexual difference symbolizes that yearning of the bride, it reflects her creaturely eros in turn. The pattern of each seems to shine forth somehow from the heart of the pattern of the other in a kind of circumcision where there's no confusion and no separation. Five. This circumcession, for its part, defines the inner structure of specifically sexual eros. This is one important reason, I think, why the energy of erotic desire fittingly takes shape as a communion and diversity of the sexes. Why this communion fittingly comes to an end in a fleeting moment of contact with eternity, right? Because that's, that's what happens. And why in passing away, this moment fittingly opens up to and even enables the gift of a new life coming down from above. It's only in this form, it seems, that sexual eros can finally wholly be what it naturally longs to become, an efficacious symbol of cosmic desire to beget in the beautiful, indeed to beget with the beautiful, by bridal participation in the fathers, which is here also common to the whole trinity, uh, fruitful self-communication. Six, in the intimacy of the embrace, Man and woman image the paternal fecundity while refracting its light through the ever-shifting interplay between self-sufficiency and need, independence and dependence, absoluteness and relationality, wealth and poverty, and so on, that characterizes, I think, both the sexual difference and creaturely eros as mu mutually corresponding figures of being. Plato captures the spirit of this interplay when he has Diodema say in the, f in the symposium that we do hear a certain logos repeated to the effect that those who seek the half of themselves are the ones who love. But my logo says that love is neither of the half nor of the whole, because in a way it's of both and neither, right? Um, unless, my dear fellow, it should prove to be good. What men love is nothing other than the good. Looked at in this light, the twofold ecstasy of sexual eros evoked by Balthazar turns out to be nothing other than the sexual, as it were, genitally, genitally enfleshed revelation and act of what Augustine calls the prima copula humane societatis, the first bond of human society. It's this original dual unity of man and woman in which our social nature makes its first complete appearance. And in so doing, exhibits the first complete embodied image of the unity of being in love in the Father. Six, attending more closely to the pattern of the embrace as I've just described it, we notice that in actualizing the unity and diversities of the sex, of the, excuse me, the unity and diversity of the sexes as a whole, um, the embrace gives it a form that can be described as marital. Within the temporal bounds of its distinctive gestalt, genital union is physically exclusive of any further partners, potentially fruitful, 
And last but not least, is somehow symbolic of eternity, of God. Even in its physical structure then, sex prefigures the shape of marriage um, as what Augustine calls a, a societas in diverso sexu, a society, a communion in diversity of sex. A communion constituted by the threefold good he classically ascribes to that embrace. Fruitfulness, proles, monogamy, fides, and a permanent bond symbolic of the wedding between God and creation, sacramentum. Everything about the sexual act, it seems, signifies its desire to die into the permanence of fruitful and monogamous marriage. Not, however, in order to find release from its temporally limited form, but in order to share, as the very time-bound act it is, in bringing forth the time-transcending good of marriage in ever fresh and fruitful ways. It's precisely when genital union, by a kind of necessary redundancy of gift, consummates, consummates the marital bond that's already established by spousal consent, that it fully becomes the moving image of eternity it always aspired to be. Seven. Now, there is something initially surprising, at least for our sensibilities, about the claim that sex fulfills its own deepest erotic urge by dying into the institutional permanence of marriage, right? Especially when it's the kind of marriage um, described by Augustine, which to a large extent is a, an ascetical path. You know, um, it is a remedium concupiscentiae to a large extent for Augustine. Not only, but to a large extent it is. Isn't this like asserting that the fondest wish of a hot fire is to be put out by a bucket of cold water? <laughs> but this objection overlooks the inhuman coldness of mere sexual heat alone. Left to its own devices, contextless sex is cut off from the source of life-giving warmth. That is, the tender, mutual regard between the sexes that actually grows out of, doesn't just found, but grows out of, a lifelong faithful and fruitful covenant between this man and this woman, right? I mean, Isaac, somebody pointed this out. Isaac married Rebecca, and then he loved her. By the same token, it would be much more apt to compare sex to a spark that yearns to become a hearth fire capable of warming an entire home. Sex finds itself only in the marital chamber. The marital chamber finds itself only in the household. And the household finds itself only in city and cosmos, just as all these realities, taking singly and together, find themselves only in enacting their distinct interrelated analogs of the same good, the same common good. The universal urge of com cosmic eros to embody an efficacious symbol of the everlasting wedding of God and creation. Eight. The irrevocable institutional permanence of fruitful monogamous marriage, it's important to stress, reflects more than just our desire for the marriage of heaven and earth. It chiefly reflects, reflects God's prior desire. Remember, the Father's trying to communicate his fecundity. Um, it reflects, in other words, that divine, that paternal eros, if you will, to which our creaturely eros is already always first an obedient response. And that, that's how it's given to us as an obedient response. By the same token, marriage isn't simply a commemoration of the world's spousal participation in divine eternity. It's also an effective pledge of God's commitment to completing what he began when calling the non-beings as beings, as Paul says in Roman, Romans 4, 8, 17, he freely invite, invited them to this participation in the first place. The ontological communion God imparts to creatures in the beginning marks the irrevocable, ever-fresh beginning of a spousal economy that he carries forward in a correspondingly spousal manner, not only by fashioning us into his bride, remember that's what the father wanted to do at the beginning, but by giving us a chance to help let him do so at every step of the way. This, in fact, is precisely why cosmic eros is covenantal and why the sexual form of this eros makes no sense apart from a, a monogamous, fruitful, and lifelong covenant binding this man personally to this woman personally and this woman personally to this man personally. It's only in such covenantal form that sexual eros and the marriage to which it belongs can wholly become what they already are by nature, an actualization of the entire unity and diversity of the sexes, of their entire one flesh union. And um, 
it's only on this condition that that actualization can be complete enough to symbolize something even bigger than itself, right? Which is not only the, the kind of yearning of all being, but the God world communion and the eschatological wedding feast that crowns it. Nine. At this point, we have to ask which comes first, sex or marriage? Because it sort of sounds like I was saying sex comes first and then marriage. In Matthew 19, Christ implicitly answers this question by recalling the primacy of the indissoluble marital bond in God's original design. Right? You'll, you'll all be familiar with that passage. It's very topical right now. Note the order this primacy implies. First, the dual unity of the sexes in act, marriage. Then, then obedience to the command to be fruitful and multiply. That's Genesis 1. And only then, Genesis 4, carnal generation as the efficacious sign of this obedience. However separable from marriage sex looks to us after the fall, in reality, there was never a time when the spousal embrace, let's call that the moral species, um, wasn't the sole raison d'etre of the physical act of genital union. Let's call that the natural species. Indeed, since as Plato teaches, nothing incomplete can be the measure of anything. We cannot even imagine, really, and I mean, I think just induction suffices to show this, an alternative use of the generative organs without implicitly comparing it to and measuring it against the paradigmatic actuality of the spousal embrace. Everything else actually just ends up being a fragmentary rearrangement of what's given. I mean, and pot, you know, as this, it just, induction suffices to show that. Um, Far from being one variety of sex among others, the spousal embrace is the truth of sex as conceived by divine wisdom. And so in this sense, you could say extra matrimonium nullus coitus. There actually is no sex outside of marriage, really. 10, even so, a final question remains. Why should spousal eros become sexual eros in the first place? Right? Because I've sort of been presupposing that all along especially if, in so doing, it takes its form, as it seems to do, from genital fruitfulness. Isn't there a mismatch, sometimes painful, sometimes comical? And, and let's be frank, I mean, everybody knows this, right? That it's not always comfortable. It's not always fun. It's not always transparent and obvious and easy. It just isn't. It's baloney to tell people that, which, which is kind of what you know, one side of, of the trajectory of this, the sexual revolution has been doing. Oh, it's natural. Um, so isn't there this kind of mismatch between um, the loftiness of the cosmic fruitfulness whose law is formulated by Christ and the lowliness of genital fruitfulness that we've been pondering? How could the latter, how could this genital fruitfulness embody, much less give its color and shape to the former, how could that be fitting? Right, and, and that's a serious question. I mean, you know, and people have answered it in, the, in our tradition in pretty radical ways. I mean, some people say um, genital fruitfulness was actually, it's like the garments of skin that God gave after the fall. It's kind of a second best a remedy for death and so forth. I mean, and I'm not saying we have to accept that, but it's worth taking seriously because it formulates a sense of unease that I think just any frank discussion of these matters has to take account of. Not to give it the last word, not to give it an undue place, obviously, but just to take it seriously. Now here's one way of answering the question. Just one way, it's a stab. Even assuming that genital fruitfulness either results from the fall, like right, that, that would be sort of our thought experiment, or is overshadowed by the effects of the fall, more of an Augustinian approach. Doesn't it still, in spite of all of that, enable spousal eros to include a physical self-emptying, right? I mean, if you just think for a minute of what happens during the act, there is a kind of a physical self-emptying on, on both sides. Um, and isn't that physical self-emptying something that, that spousal eros um, needs in order to to realize somehow its constitutive intertwining of ecstasy and ecstasy of life and death, right? So sure, you can imagine maybe there would have been some other more fitting way 
you know, of reproducing children, right? That, like I say, that thought experiment is not unfamiliar to our tradition. But even, uh, even so, even so, it still, <laughs> it still manages to give spousal eros something that it needs, a kind of a physical dimension to its self-emptying. And doesn't this physical emptying, self-emptying in turn, uh, play a, a really crucial role here? I mean, um, isn't it something that enables spousal eros to participate in the father's desire to communicate his fecundity? In fact, doesn't it show that the father's desire to communicate his fecundity in some way goes all the way into the heart of matter so that it can be reflected back? Right? Isn't that what we were saying about the bride in a certain sense? Okay, I'm, I'm almost done. I, I, uh, um, of course, we, we've, all, we've said this, right? The, the requisite physical self-emptying can't happen without a surrender or at least a non-refusal of the generative finality of sex. It's just that there, there's a kind of adamantine factuality about that. You just can't get around that. And it's hard on the outside and sweet on the inside. But inasmuch as such surrender or such non-refusal is a form of possession and detachment, as some of our friends here define, define virginity, insofar as it's an expression of that having and not having that St. Paul talks about in the Corinthian, first Corinthians, then it's an anticipatory sign in another way. It's an anticipatory sign of virginal fecundity. Somehow, right, by letting that physical self-emptying happen, right at the heart of the act, there's some kind of analog to this virginal fecundity, right? That was the father's from all eternity. That Somehow, right, however you account for this, whether in the more radical way or in the Augustinian way or whatever, um, was imparted to and lost by our first parents. That shines forth in the virginal conception of the immaculate God-bearer. And that, as the Lord teaches, is somehow going to be the lot of the blessed who, quote, neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Last bit, 11. The question I've just tried to answer is not an unimportant one. The very fact that the beauty of begetting is in intertwined with suffering, at least potentially, underscores its weight. And women, are, of course, are in a position to feel this weight firsthand, right? I mean, you know, a lot could be said about this, but just think of morning sickness, labor pains, and the risk of death and childbirth. Think, too, of the sacrifices that they and their husbands must make in order to honor the indissoluble nexus between union and procreation, especially now, right, in a deranged world like the one Father was describing, right, where, where there just are no supports. And so everything ends up looking like this heroic decision, you know, that you're carrying out in sort of martyr-like solitude because we, we, we have a kind of a lousy cultural setting. You know. Does this mean then that my ascription of radiant wholeness to the spousal embrace is just a simplistic and romantic projection? So we're right at the heart of this ideal and real question. Well, it doesn't. For if, as I've argued, this wholeness that I've been talking about is nothing other than life in the unity of life and death, it can't be dismissed as some beautiful but impotent ideal hovering over the ugly, all-consuming reality of life. That's a false dichotomy. Because it's all about wealth and poverty in the same. It's all about being in the middle. Well, right? and that the end and the beginning shine forth together in ever new ways. They keep meeting, they come together over and over and over again, right in the middle. So having said that, I just want to conclude by saying that the whole tenor of my argument has been that 
um, this wholeness that I've been talking about isn't a beautiful ideal in the modern sense. It's kind of not nice for those who can get it, right? Um, but it's reality itself. It's the ecstatic ecstasy of being. It's the unity of life and life and death and blah, 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 all those things. And it's that reality working quietly, slowly, implacably to reveal its beauty through the saturated and sometimes viscous space of, um, and time of married life. Even in precisely that part of married life that we can call genital fruitfulness and the sacrificial toil that it sometimes exacts. Thank you very much. <laughs>